You're listening to the Let Him Cook podcast, fueled by Cody Road and the Wild Rose Casino Studios. Nigel, four days of madness are are in the books. Iowa State came out on the other side. Uh, kind of just like looking at the bracket as a whole, kind of chalky. Um, yeah, a lot of there, a couple upsets mixed in, but I don't think quite nearly as chaotic as maybe the past couple years. Um, any, any reasoning that you have for that? The only thought I really have is like bid stealers. I think we got kind of not the best mid-major programs in because of how the conference tournaments shook out, but just kind of a, an underwhelming, uh, not, not a lot of madness in March madness so far. Yeah. I, there wasn't a lot of like buzzer beaters. I mean, obviously Houston last night, that was a great game, right. but first round. Yeah, it was, it was very underwhelming and i know even like you made comments about it yesterday just how it's just been boring to yeah. a certain degree a lot of blowouts yeah and i think like you said it's just i think a lot of teams that were invited weren't ready to dance yeah. and i think i mean it's it's a it's kind of showing why like i don't necessarily think for mid-major teams like a conference like championship and a conference tournament championship is the only thing that should be getting you into March Madness. I think, you know, you got to kind of balance and consider more things. But again, like last week we talked about the lack of we don't have that week to before conference tournament and the actual tournament to, all right, let's think about who's actually worthy of a seed. Like people can't even make rational decisions because there's a not a lot of turnaround. So I feel like that's kind of like – it's kind of like – a it's a – it's kind of just it's it's a huge reason as to why you know we can at, at some, sometimes have very boring first rounds and like we said if TV programs are trying to you know excite the the first and second round like this is definitely not the the recipe for that clearly because it just wasn't that entertaining of basketball it was really it, you might as well have had you know the old format of just like let's balance out the regions and right. let's see who can do what because. I think you put some of the the lower seeds in the East region and another region, and you probably have more competitive regions because yeah. it's more balanced. And again, but what do we know? We're just kids. Um, we, we it's not like we talked about this last week and kind of foreshadowed it. And now it's come to fruition. It's like I don't feel as bad about all of my uh, open ended statements at the committee. I think they really need to go after this tournament, no matter who loses. They really need to go to the, the chalkboard and, you know, talk about how can we make this better. Uh, speaking of what do we know, update on the DPI, not doing well. I will say seven of the Elite Eight DPI teams are still in the mix. I only got 11 of the Sweet 16 right with DPI. And BYU and Auburn I, are by far kind of the biggest DPI loved them, and then they lost right away. And then Clemson, yeah. the DPI hates, and they're in the Sweet 16. So those are the three teams that the DPI was most wrong on. I still think Auburn's a great team. Those ones always kind of upset me. I would say the same thing about, like, the Iowa State team that lost to UAB or the Baylor team that lost to Yale. What was that? Just seven, eight years ago? Yeah. Um, okay, so so like, it, it doesn't mean Auburn's a bad team because they lost to Yale. They were just the worst team that day. But yeah. that it hurts the DPI pride a little bit. See, because Auburn was the second best team according to the metrics I use, and just got bounced unceremoniously by a couple of Ivy League dudes. So tough, tough. But I think for it's just a weird. Again, Auburn was put in a very awkward situation because I don't think they're a four seed. Like, right? I think they got gypped. Yeah. So, so to even be in that situation where, like, you got to play an awkward team in Yale, and then you have a guy like John Polakaitis, who is actually, I didn't realize this, is dating Kylie Fierbach. Weird, but wow. uh, yeah, yeah. Talk about a uh, talk about when worlds collide, but yeah. has an out of performance game, just absolutely electric from him. But ob- like, just it's it sets it's a setup when, when you have too many good teams that are your four, one, two, three, four, five seeds someone is going to go home disappointed out of those. Like it's kind of human nature where it's March madness. It's been underwhelming this year, but one of those top seeds is going home and it it just sucks. It had to be Auburn because I don't think they were very deserving of that, you know, that that type of exit, but also John Polakaitis played him in high school. And let's, I don't want to be that guy. Like I knew he was going to be this. I didn't, but 
in in his freshman year, he went to Nequa Valley High School in Naperville, Illinois, and I knew he was going to be good. Like yeah. the guy was just a streaky, skinny lefty with a. Oh, he already had a silky mid range, and to see him just like got Auburn guys this close to him pulling it, man, it is it's always cool to see all those Illinois guys, you know, that make an impact in the tournament. Cameron Crutwig, Oakland's uh, Chris Conway, they I mean, they did a huge feat in beating Kentucky in the first round. So shout out to all the Illinois Hoopers who are still dancing in their March Madness. Uh, Nigel, I was tuned into Iowa State, South Dakota State. I had a couple friends almost jokingly ask me who was I rooting for in that game, and I think my dad had the same. My dad graduated from South Dakota State, huge Iowa State fan. Um, so I was nervous just of a, a point, kind of like we said, Henderson, who I came like, I love that coach. I don't know. I mean, I really think he could go like if he keeps winning the summit league, I think he can get a job. Like we just saw DeVries got at West Virginia. Cause I, he reminds me a lot of odds had yeah. super good press conferences said every right thing you could say <clears throat> really impressed by Eric Henderson, but just kind of, a, like we said, a weird connection. Him and Otts go way back. Um, the McDermott coaching tree. I just thought it might be a little deja vu. You know, Otts coaching against his former team. And the first half, I'll, like, I was a little nervous. I was getting some. We just were kind of letting South Dakota State score the ball more than I thought they'd be able to. I, I thought, you know, we're used to playing really good, athletic, you know, five-star kids we should be able to lock up South Dakota state, not let them score 50. And they had, I think 30 in the first half. Yeah. So I, I that was kind of came at a, it came after a big run though. It was like 20 yeah. to seven, you know? So again, like, like usual, this team, because they play so hard, you know, they run out of gas and then right. a team that can shoot the ball that is a bit older and knows how to kind of, you know, fight that, that tug and pull of like just a team making a run. Um, I think they just took advantage of like, all right, let's just try to stay in this game. Cause when it comes to these lower seeds, this trend I've realized is like when you are close, I know those, everyone goes into the locker room thinking, okay, we have a chance. So let's kind of regroup. Let's see what we can fix. And then obviously for the most part, if a better team is in that situation, they're like, all right, let's turn it on. And I feel like that's kind of what Iowa state did in the second half. But yeah, to go to, to get back to your point, like, if I was saying I wasn't nervous, I was for a little bit just because it's yeah. like, come on, let's let's keep this lead where it was because the start was phenomenal. I mean, right. Hassan's lobs, Keyshawn getting to the rack with uh, absorbing contact and finishing. I mean, it was just a great overall game. And then obviously Milan, what a debut for yeah. the NCAA tournament. He acted like he had been there for three years. So just, again, this team is maturing before our eyes, and I love it. I, I, and I really think it translated to Washington State. Yeah, and then exactly like you said, I think there's some benefit in not blowing out, like not just having a cakewalk in that first round. I think, you know, Iowa State probably went into halftime saying, hey, we got to go win this game. Like this game's not over. We got to go play our best basketball. Because like I can't think of one off the top of my head in this tournament, but if you see like just a, a one seed or a two seed breeze through that first round and win by 35 and either the seven ten or eight, nine, they're playing had like a, you know, down to the wire last shot on the line kind of game. You're just in a different kind of, I, I don't know if it's conditioning. I don't know if you're just more battle tested, but I feel like that team has an edge. So I was almost a little happy. Iowa state kind of had to fight for it against South Dakota state. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think Mom Chilovich getting 19 points, shooting eight for 15. I think that was huge for his confidence going into the tournament. Like you said, Ward had a big game. The only thing I was a little worried about at the end of South Dakota State, Ward and Lipsy looked a little Lipsy's shoulder, and then Ward was kind of favoring one foot over the other. So I just like didn't I was like, please nobody get hurt. This game's over. Like everybody yeah. just stay healthy and let's move on to the next one. And like we said, Nigel, the committee tried to get cute. They wanted to get Iowa State Drake, and the bracket gods would not give it to them. Washington they got State, Soldier Boyd. Yeah, Washington State got got past the Bulldogs. A great game, a, a really good game, and I I do feel for the Drake fans because I mean they went into Arch Madness knowing, hey, we got to win this tournament to even get to the dance. They get there, lose first round, lose their coach, lose their best player. So. To the Drake fans, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry that we didn't have to play you. Um, but Washington State, it, it was that was no layup either. I mean, I 
I knew their length, I thought, would cause problems. I think they're one of the tallest teams in D1 basketball. Um, rebound well. And they beat Arizona twice. So they can beat really good teams. And, and we've seen that from them. Their coach, um, I just saw it's going to Stanford. So a, so a lot of coaching carousel going on. But um, I would say, what did you see from the Cyclones in the first half uh, against the Cougs? Um, I, the biggest thing was poise. Like, yeah. I think they weren't rattled by Washington State being able to hold their own. Like, I feel like they were able to kind of kind of do a tango with Washington State and not get too, like, rattled when, you know, they made a big play or whatnot. I think they always kind of answered back with something else. And I think, like you said, like, being in these close games, but, like, you're still winning convincingly, mm-hmm. I love that type of – I love that kind of play right before the Sweet 16 because this is really when things start to turn up. You know, everything gets a little hotter, and I just think it's gonna it's gonna end up being a huge benefit for us when we do play Illinois because that game's gonna take a lot of poise and a lot of just like concentration. And I, I would assume probably only playing seven six guys maybe in a game like that just because you know you're playing so much experience and Terrence Shen and and everyone else on, you know, the Illini. But I just saw a very balanced day scoring. I saw a great game from Taman being able to shoot well from the perimeter, hitting step-back threes. I mean, if Taman is hitting step-back threes, no. good luck. Buckle up. It's going to be it's going to be a fun ride for the rest of the tournament. Um and then obviously, I thought Jones was huge, 14 points off the bench, 3 of 5 from 3. Like I think that's going to be secret weapon, man, is the three-headed snake that is Lipsy, Gilbert, and Jones. I just think they've been playing really well. They're clicking on all cylinders. And then Milan wasn't a South Dakota State performance, but still 50% from three, 10 points. I mean, that's all. If if we're going to have a midday for Milan, let it be that. Hit two threes, get about 10, 12 points, and we're in good shape. And then everyone else kind of falls in line. Hassan, again, two, seven points off the bench. Um, and just again making really athletic plays. I, there, there was one play, Keyshawn's kind of purling to the to the basket, kind of just throws something up, and Hassan just like tosses it off the backboard. So I feel like they were just making a lot of great plays, and Dylan's cat is making a cameo. Yeah, so Thor he getting in here ball too. But uh, <laughs> we're good. We're good. I got I got really distracted. That's a big cat. I just didn't want him to hurt himself here. Oh no, you're good. You're good. Um, but yeah, Not like I said, just. They just they just made a lot of great plays, and I think we were able to weather a storm that had we not been poised, had we not been, I guess, clicking on offense, that that game could have gotten away from us pretty fast. Who I was really impressed with, Jalen Wells, even when he played Drake, um, there was a lot of talk about their point guard, Rice. Um, but Jalen Wells, even against Drake, super efficient and yeah. came out against Iowa State in the first half. And did the same thing, 16 points. Um, I mean, there there was times where like Iowa State was up 20 to you know 14, but Wells already had like 10 points. And I was like, if we can slow down him, yeah, you know, I'll kind of live with the rest of it. Right. Which I mean, Uh, we kind of did because he he was two of eleven from three. So right. And then exactly, and I think I hope we could see something similar against Illinois where you let Domask or Terrence Shannon really start to get in a groove in the first half, and then the second half is just, you know, make that guy's life hell and let the other guys beat us. Because, yeah. like you said, I mean, finished with 20 points and had 16 in the first half. So they found an answer, and I think two of those four points were at the free throw line. So yeah. he never really got in a groove in the second half after looking like an NBA player in the first half. And I he could be an NBA player. I mean, he's got the size, he's got the skill. So um, I was impressed by him. And like you said, it, it is – kind of shocked me that Keyshawn Gilbert three for 14 from the field, these guards, you know, between Keyshawn Taman and, and Curtis Jones, they do so much besides scoring that their impact doesn't really show up in the, you know, their shooting percentages. Um, Keyshawn Taman, their, their defense, Kurt, what they do when they're not on the ball, you know, fighting over screens, diving for loose balls, you know, getting rebounds, all of those guys just look like you know they've been in the they've been in this moment. They've seen the big lights. They're not scared of the stage. They know what's at stake. So, like I don't you said, think any boy, of them have it outside of Taman. Like 
I don't think so. Curtis, I mean, and, Curtis hasn't. Keyshawn hasn't. Yeah, this is brand new for both of them. And they right. Like been here. And that might be another, you know, Kansas City Big 12 tournament. I, it's not quite the same, but you're playing teams like Baylor and Houston on a neutral site. Um, you know, that, that does go somewhere. Like, I, I think that helps confidence of, you know, we can be on this stage. We don't need to be at Hilton to win these games. So, well, I feel um, like, too, Omaha was like a Kansas City junior. Like, yeah, it's it definitely had it. We had its perks of of being there other than any other region, just because, you know, the same people that are going to travel to KC are going to travel to Omaha. You know, that's, yeah. and it was there's some idiot on Twitter that said Iowa State had the easiest pass to the Sweet 16. Let's pump the brakes a little bit. Uh, yeah, Purdue was in that. Indianapolis and <laughs> North Carolina was in Charlotte. So yeah. let's not act like we just, you know. We won because we were the better team both games. We didn't win. North Carolina also had probably arguably the worst 16 seed, despite not being the overall one seed, which was right. You know, so people are stupid. I people yeah, if you don't see the actual problem with the bracket, like don't talk, don't bring Iowa State in there and talk like they're the problem. I that's that's right. not what we're gonna do today. The East region is why most people have a problem with the bracket, putting yeah. Iowa State, Illinois, Auburn, and Yukon all in the same region. I know Auburn lost right away, but like you said, I think if Auburn is in the South region or the Midwest region, that's that's an Elite Eight team or that's a Final Four team that doesn't have to play UConn in the Sweet 16. So yeah, I think they're playing just, Houston in the Sweet 16 if, right. if they're seeded correctly. I just want to pump the brakes a little bit on Iowa State having an easy path. I will say this is exactly what I said I wanted. I wanted Washington State, and then I wanted Illinois um, for reasons like – you know, I, I think star-driven guards, you look at how LJ Cryer played against us or even Jamal Shedd and the losses he had to Iowa State. Looked good at home. Um, but, I mean, you know, Jacoby Walter, uh, Dewan Harris, a lot of these really good guards in the Big 12 struggled against Iowa State because of the defense, Lipsy, Keyshawn, Curtis Jones. We just, I you know, I'll live with guards. I know Terrence Shane Jr. is a big body. He's going to try to get downhill. Um, and depending on the officiating crew, I could see Cyclones being very, um, unpleased with the whistle because I think that's his whole game is try to force contact and see if the ref calls a foul. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's what he's really good at. So, um, depending on the officiating, if they let us play, oh man, Terrence Shannon could be hurting because I mean, we're going to, we're going to be, he's not going to get anything easy. If he's going to the rim, he's going to feel it. So. Yeah. Um, I'm looking well, I remember, forward to what that brings. Yeah. I, well, and I remember this too, when, uh, Terrence was at tech, uh, yeah. back when they had like Santo Silva and all that, they made that sweet 16 run two years ago. Um, he was getting worked by Jeremy Roach when they played Duke, yeah. like Jeremy Roach was given the business in the second half. So I think Taman and Jeremy Roach have like this, a similar like height, like ratio i know they're taman's probably a little broader than jeremy jeremy's a frail guy but i i think that if that is a matchup i think taman could really disrupt his rhythm and i think with domask i feel like again i would toss maybe hassan or milan on him just and so that could blank. really throw off his rhythm as well just because he's probably used to playing those traditional wings like the guys from purdue and everyone else in the big to right. uh, big 10 excuse me um, I just think Iowa State really has the athletes to kind of get Illinois guys off the rhythm because just they, I don't think – like we didn't see – we hadn't seen Washington State's length before. I don't think Illinois has seen our length before outside of Purdue with Edie, you know? Yeah. And that really that's just one guy. Like Purdue isn't a really long team like down the line. Um, so I just – I really think like we have – good enough and awkward enough athletes to really challenge Illinois' top guys. And I think the biggest one is going to be taming and cutting the head off the snake in Terrence Shannon because yeah. being him being 6'6", six, six, I think there's advantages for, for Taman where if he's just playing low, that ball is going to be right in his pocket like all day. And I think Taman can really affect him on the ball, especially if he's picking him up 90 feet. Um, and, and, of course, I think – the reason the casual basketball fan is going to be interested in this one, Iowa State going into the tournament had the number one overall defense. Illinois has the number one overall offense going into the tournament. So it's kind of the old unstoppable force against immovable object, if you will, of yeah. 
you know, when Illinois has the ball, what's going to happen? Are they going to be able to get past Iowa State's defense or is their offense going to crumble against Iowa State's defense? So I think that's the big overall draw. I will say another Illinois player that I am kind of worried about just because I think you're right. Like, I think it just so happens that we have good players to guard Terrence Shannon Jr. and Marcus Domask, who are incredible offensive players, and we just have some defensive answers. I think Coleman Hawkins is a guy that might, just with matchups, see some more open looks than maybe he has in, in the past games. And I feel like he's been there for – like, I feel like he was playing with, like, Io and Kofi Coburn. So, I feel like he, he was, was in there for a but he was a freshman. Yeah. So, yeah. It, uh, again, though, if, if Coleman Hawkins is going to be your guy offensively, right. I can live with that. Okay that, with that, that. Yeah, that's your third and fourth option scoring-wise. And But, right. <laughs> excuse me, Jesus, it's allergy season, guys. I'm, I apologize. Um, Big fella, number 42, lefty. Danger. Not a crafty. Kind of crap. From Baylor. Uh, and he went there with Matthew Mayer when, like, there was just a Baylor kind of – they just all went to Illinois that one offseason. Um, but, yeah, he is. I mean, he he moved really well for his size. And uh, Moorhead State, he had a really good game against them. I watched that yeah. one. And he was moving well, yeah. So, I, I think that's going to be a challenge for Rob. I think you, that's a game you're just going to play with your hands out and move because I think he can be a little – deceptive i guess with his yeah. like, quickness um and really too like when someone is smooth around the basket it's like it's so it's so cliche but like i feel like if you can kind of just like watch their feet like they're gonna go where their feet tell them to go or like right. their hips i was always told at like playing basketball like watch someone's hips because right. no matter what they're doing like head fakes and all this stuff like all this stuff up here it's to distract you i feel like if rob is very intent on w- watching where He's actually gonna go. I think you're gonna be able to contain him well. And then obviously with a big body, you got his wall up. Like it, you can't really go away from anything like over complex. I think you gotta just kind of keep it simple with guys who are such like uh, like threats offensively. Because like the whole starting five can really hurt you. You know from for for 40 minutes. So I think again, I feel very confident because it's like we've talked about all these guys that can make an impact defensively. We haven't even talked about Keyshawn and Curtis. Right. And right. I don't think Illinois has an answer for those two people. And when Brad Underwood, because he was asked about us, he was like, how do you feel about Iowa State? He was like, I've seen them play like drastically, but I love a coach who has not seen us play all year. Yeah, that That is a coach, in my humble opinion, I think you're going to meet your ultimate demise. I think that was your first mistake. You haven't watched us all year, bro, as good as we've been. I don't know, man. I don't know. I will say, too, I mean, outside of Rutgers, who was one of the top 10 defenses, the only problem is they had, like, the 300 best offense. So, I, right. I like, I don't know how much Illinois has seen. And, again, like, I really think unless you play Iowa State or Houston, you haven't really seen a team like Iowa State or Houston. Where it's just yeah. a different beast. And the other thing I was going to say, you know, even if there is a, a quick whistle on, on Thursday, by the way, we got a, we got a midnight game uh, – Tip is, yeah, I didn't know I was gonna have to take man. a nap before. Jesus, we got work 9 in the morning. PM, Nine PM local, probably get down, get done after eleven PM central. Um, but like our depth, especially you know, if we get a couple bigs in foul trouble, even last year, especially two years ago, basically it felt like through all of Hoiberg and Prom, we have never had depth, and finally we have some depth in the front court where, you know, if if Rob Jones has three fouls at the under eight in the first half, I'm not like, well, this game's over. I mean, at yeah. times, if Brockington had three fouls in the first half, you might as well not play the second half because, like, who the hell – what are we going to do? So I, I think that's another big thing of being able to, like, you know, you bring off to Marion Watson's, you know, his energy and having him with fresh legs halfway through Shit the game. Omaha. Right. I mean, we just have – we can kind of throw guy after guy after guy and just let them cause havoc and – you know, hopefully foul trouble isn't a major storyline. But if it is, we finally have the depth in the front court to be like, all right, we'll just throw in a, a five star, you know, recruit at you. See what yeah. see what that does. So <laughs> thankfully we we've got some dudes uh coming off the bench because I think we might need a couple. That is that is such a funny like for T if we're playing chess, for TJ right. to have all these pieces and to be like, man, we're we're in a bind. Yeah. 
I'll give you this five star recruit. How about that? Yeah. Like checkmate. Like what a checkmate by TJ. Yeah. I, I there there's there are you're starting to see now some positives not playing a five star all year, at least to the minutes that we kind of assumed he was gonna get off top. Um, but yeah, no, even Pav, like who didn't play against Washington State, I think if given the opportunity, can make something shake. Like I I really think if Curtis isn't having an off is having an off day shooting, I think he can come in and replace Curtis, which if, the fact that you have a, a replacement offensively for Curtis is crazy. Like, yeah, that just goes to prove again, like you said, how deep this team is. I think like the more I'm starting to look at the X's and O's of everything and the matchups, I really think Illinois doesn't match up well with us. And I love to be in that situation. Cause I think if you can take advantage of that early, get out to an early lead and push that, like, don't, don't, I, I, I think going forward, you kind of have to use the UConn mentality of just trying to blow out every team. And a team that is so strong, like us defensively, that has to be the mentality going forward. Because if you can, for the next, what, we got four more games until the national championship. Like, yeah. that's got to be the the mindset going forward because it's going to help you down the road of, okay, the bigger the opponent we keep this mentality going of let's just try to get like, let's try to have our defense obviously make the first punch, but then let's like try to also like not let a team creep back in. I think it's really going to benefit us going forward, especially in more environments where we're not going to have a lot of support for the rest of the tournament, I guess intimately there. Like, cause I don't know how many people are actually going to travel even from Illinois to Boston, let alone Iowa state. So, uh, and then obviously Phoenix, I doubt a lot of people outside of boosters are probably going to be down there or, you know, life lifelong fans that can get out of work. So I, it's just going to be like the, those those quirky little benefits that we had from a crowd atmosphere wise. We're not going to have anymore. And I think the team has right. to get very acclimated to that. So to obviously compensate for that, we got to try to just get out to these early leads. And I think Illinois is a great team to do that and start doing that now. Like we got to just. The, the first punch has to be ours. It has to, especially in a late night game like this. Looking at team stats, there's some there's some interesting uh, contrasts. So the big one, and this is kind of why I've been saying since as soon as the bracket came out, I wouldn't mind Illinois. They are 310th in turnover margin of about 350 teams. Iowa State is second behind Houston. Yeah. Um, and a, a lot of teams have bad turnover margins because they just don't force turnovers. Like, like that's a crazy case with Creighton. It, Creighton doesn't turn the ball over much, but they almost never force turnovers on defense. Um, Illinois turns the ball over a lot against teams that aren't as good at defense as Iowa State. So that that's one area where Iowa State, you know, think of the games against like TCU where we're causing like 20 plus turnovers or like a Cincinnati game. Um, the bad part, they are eighth in rebounding margin. Iowa State is 171st. So I, I think this game really is as simple as who's winning the rebound battle and how much is Illinois turning the ball over. Another quick thing to look at, Illinois has got bad three-point defense. So, you know, if we can really get ball reversals going, get, yeah, get <laughs> Milan going, get Kurt going, if Tame and Lipsy's hitting step backs. Like, there are some holes in Illinois' game that benefits Iowa State. And really, the only one that they got on us is rebounding. Um, but, I mean, that we've seen Iowa State lose games because of that. So, sure up the boards and then just wreak havoc. I, I think that is kind of the one-two punch that Iowa State needs to, you know, go to the Elite Eight for the first time, basically in our lifetimes. I, I've seen another crazy stat that I didn't know. TJ is the only coach in Iowa State history to make two Sweet 16s. And I guess just how they were spaced out, I it didn't. I felt like Hoiberg went to two for sure. I just kind of assumed you stay. She did, um, but that kind of blew my mind that Otz is the first one to do it. And what I feel like Iowa State, maybe not a Sweet Sixteen regular, but I think we've made four of the last ten Sweet Sixteen. So that just kind of that that was impressive to me that TJ. We've done also it had a lot of coaches. That's in true. The last decade, so and TJ's done it twice in three years. So yeah credit to him because that's that's kind of nuts doing that in three years yeah no it, it's i think it's a testament to just like really his philosophy like it because at, at first i at his first press conference i was like i don't know if this is the the 
the recipe. I don't know if Midwest right. guys are the answer. I don't know if, you know, this is going to be, it's going to be a process that like is worth like longevity, but he's, he's gone out and proven everybody wrong just by, you know, staying, you know, close to his values and beliefs and what a team should be. And I think, you know, it's, it's proven every day. And I think, like looking back on it now, I really don't hate it because you see how many Midwest guys have a big impact in March. And it just seems like these guys who, even though they haven't been to the big dance, they're still making that impact because they're just built for this moment. And I think a lot of guys on this team exactly are built for this moment. Also, uh, did you see you mentioned Charlotte earlier? Do you see we got a we got a transfer from Charlotte today? I was just gonna talk about this. Yeah. Uh I'm hope I can get this right. And if I don't, I'll get it right once we know him a little bit better. Dijon Johnson. <laughs> I believe. Is that Sorry, the repeat, name his, repeat his name. I didn't hear you. Dijon Johnson. I'm look that up. We're gonna have two Keyshawns on team next year. Dijon, like the mustard. Oh, Dijon. Let me sure make sure. Okay. I wrote it as Deshaun. Deshaun. Deshaun Jackson. Jackson. What a name. Yeah. Um. But nonetheless, yeah, I think. Of the of the small highlights I've seen, six probably six eight, and you know compared to our bigs that we have now, most of them Trey King can stretch the floor at times, um, but he kind of has a handle. Um, if you get him fifteen feet away from the basket, he can kind of pivot, turn his weight on you, go over his opposite shoulder and get down to the rim, and he's got some some nasty dunks in in just like half court offense. So, I, Is he I from Charlotte, I don't know originally. I mean he he's. He plays for the Charlotte 49ers. Yeah. Um, but I and every clip that you kind of see him making these highlight dunks, like right before he says it, the commentators are like, you know, here's kind of the X factor for this team, and then he does something crazy. So yeah. Mm. Mm. The first thing I thought was just like he's an athlete. Like he's doing that to your blue devils. What was the final score? <laughs> Probably a lot to a little. So I, I think almost like a Hassan Ward, but I think his his skill might be a little bit higher, but kind of like the athleticism of Hassan. But I mean, look at the handle there. Yeah. And then the tough leg. So if I see Hassan hit in and out, um Right. Woo. I might have a mental breakdown because what is happening? He'd be a he'd be a top fifteen pick. So I'm I'm really excited about him. I think he's a guy that can kind of and everybody knows it. Like we're we're losing our bigs, and I think this team next year, we're gonna have great guards if everybody you know stays in place, and we get the guys returning that we think we will. So, um, I, I think it's gonna come down to who we can get bigs, um, how much Omaha Man, we just need Dennis much- Rodman's in the portal. Dennis Rodman. We need Dennis Rodman's oh. like people who are willing to yeah. rebound. That is it. Like, if, I really think like size doesn't matter, man. If we can just get gritty rebounders, if this guy uh, is is anything that he's he he's claims out to be, I think he can be a great person on the glass, you know. And because guard, it's proven we're it's proven it right now. Guards are winning games for you in March. Like it yeah. is what it is. And honestly, would you consider Milan a guard at this point? Like I know he's six. He's six now. You can toss the forward label on him, but is he not a guard at this point? I, yeah, I think he has the benefits of a guard and just like a forward's body. I mean, he yeah. does things that guards do. I the only thing I wish we would see him a little bit more is in like pick and pop actions. Like I, I wish he had the ball in his hands a little bit more and ran the ran the offense through him. And maybe we'll see that next year. But I, I yeah, probably like we kind of have a four guard lineup if we have him, Curtis, Keyshawn, and Taman. Yeah. I feel like with the two men you you when you directly try to draw up a two-man game with Milan, I feel like automatically you kind of X out two people because like two people got to go to the opposite corner just to have right. spacing. And I don't think they necessarily want to do that because they've, they've been moving the ball so well. Like against right. Washington State, I would say really moved the ball well. And it was like kind of anybody's game because everyone was kind of just feeling it because everyone was willing to you know share the ball so easily. So I just feel like I don't want to take that aspect away from it. But, yes, I think next year when he's more of a guy offensively, yes, he's going to have kind of that, like, option, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but, again, if, if we can continue to move the ball like this, we may not even need it. So who, who knows? The other kind of looking at the bracket in full, I really do think Iowa State-Illinois is probably one of the games that college basketball fans are most excited about in the Sweet 16. 
and unbiased uh, towards your your affiliation, I really think Houston Duke is probably you know my second favorite matchup we have. Man. Houston got you know the committee said, "How can we ruin Nigel's day?" Yeah. Oh, let let's stress him the hell out. Let's do that. That'd be fun. Uh, Houston on the ropes last night. It seemed like their whole team fouled out um, in overtime. Uh, kind of their yeah trio backcourt fouled out. Shed Crier Sharp. Uh, Had that a walk on come in, shoot free throws. I was right. I was like, bro, man. They got some. They got some senior walk on uh, shooting clutch free throws. So Houston had a. Wade Taylor needs nail. to go into sales. He'll have a great. He'll have a great yeah. career in sales because he sold last night, tossing up bull crap at the rim. He's getting blocked by God out there. No one and the, you shit last shot. Yeah. He got bad. blocked by a ghost, bro. I didn't know Casper was their six man. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's kind of been the story with Texas AM all year. It's like how far can Wade Taylor take you? And sometimes and that's, it's like that's the team who beat us. We beat Houston right. twice, but can't beat that team. We'll Come beat on. That team. Yeah. Yeah, that hurts. And we'd probably be a one seed if we beat that team. So that also yeah. hurts. Um, but yeah, that, that game was kind of nuts. Uh, Florida, Colorado was a really good game. Um, what did you, you say, Colorado? Yeah. Oh, it's oh, Rod. No. <laughs> that's the Midwest coming out. Don't yeah, worry no, about it. Dylan is from Minnesota. He's not telling y'all. That's the a, that's a thing. He's He's got Minnesota tendencies. Western Iowa, just a, a different a different scene out there, Nigel. Um, trying to think of, like, dude, that's the thing is, like, a lot of these games were, like, 20-point games with 15 minutes left in the second half, and you're just kind of yeah. on to the next one. So, um, man, what, what games kind of stood out to you? I'm kind of drawing a blank. That's just been kind of how March has gone. Oh, we got to talk about Kentucky-Oakland. Duh. Of course, but I think the, the future rounds for us are – Definitely um, NC State. Didn't think yeah. they'd be here right now. Big I uh, first of all, DJ Birds, like as <laughs> much love as he's been getting on Twitter, there have been some crazy tweets about his weight. <laughs> Just uncalled <laughs> for. And, like, uh, someone, someone said like DJ Burns, he may have won the battle, but diabetes will win the war. I was like, yo, <laughs> this man is a family. Let's chill out. Oh my gosh! But yeah, no, I think he's gonna. I think he's really gonna uh, turn some heads. He, the fact that he even has a chance at an elite eight is crazy, just given yeah. the the run they made in the ACC tournament. But yeah, no, definitely the top two that I don't know, man. Like, I'm I'm definitely gonna be losing some sleep. That it's my day off, so I'm gonna have nothing to do but watch those two games. So, yeah. I, Duke Houston, man, I'm nervous because I feel like McCain already had his huge day right. yesterday so i think houston is going to be you know on him when he gets off the bus so who's gonna be the next guy i thought filipowski played a lot better um but he was he really was pissing me off in the first round like just being soft complaining that he's not getting the ball i i it pisses me off because he's very vocal on social media about like being the next leitner but then he gets on like he gets on the floor and then doesn't do leitner things like right. if you're gonna be an asshole be a good asshole like Stop on someone's chest and then score 30. I don't need you to, yeah. like, cry and because you're not getting the ball and then have three points at the end of the game. Like, that's not what we're doing here. But um, I was going to say, that's probably, like, what I'm looking forward to. I mean, there are great guards everywhere in that Houston-Duke game. But, like, how is Filipowski going to do with all the physicality? Because I we're either going to see, like, a classic, like, Duke, white, heel, like, just the villain goes off for, like, 25 and has a bloody nose and – there's like some great picture of him, like just blood all over his face. <laughs> it's either going to be that or he's going to get home and be like, I never want to play basketball again because I just got assaulted on the basketball court in front of national television. So that's what I'm excited. We're, it's like sink or swim for Filipowski. If you want to be a Duke legend, here's your chance or, you know, get sent. It's not even that, man. You want to go to the NBA. Like people are going to look yeah. at this game and be like, I don't know, man. You probably don't got that dog in you. And then you're probably going right. to come back for year three to prove all those people wrong. So I think if you're really serious about going to the league this year, this is your game to prove yourself and the story. Yeah. But I think Mitchell will, he'll kind of translate really easily to those guys. And I, I just think it's going to be a good game, but Iowa state, Illinois, that game is going to feed families. Yeah. Like 
I, I don't know a person who isn't going to be tuned in. To that. If you love basketball, you will be tuned in to that, that, that basketball game. Also, the bonus is Kevin Harlan's on the call. I know it's 9 o'clock at night, but we're going to have just an iconic crew. You know, shout out to Avery Johnson doing his best. That I just don't know. Uh, That's what I said, too. I heard him. I, like, I like the guy. I want to like you, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I like He just doesn't oh sound like God. March. He sounds like July. Like yeah. he, Avery Johnson is a great guy to be calling summer league games. Right. Like get a, get him on the whatever Ice Cube does in the summers where it's like a yes. bunch of washed up NBA players. The big three. Let Avery Johnson have a field day with that. I just don't know if I need him in March. I know Jeff Dubroff was happy to see him. I know he's a San Antonio kid, so I saw him get yeah. a picture with him. But, yeah, no, I don't know if he needs to be calling the primetime games. Right. Like they're in the Sweet 16 games, there are – you know, levels. And I don't think this is one of them. Um, another one I am excited about because I really do think if UConn is going to go out early, because everyone is like real big on like, well, we know UConn isn't going to repeat and the, the, number, the number one overall seed never wins. Uh, so how do you think they're going to do against San Diego State? And that's, that's what's going to be match. Yeah. What we like, UConn blew the doors off of Northwestern, and honestly, I don't remember what 16 seed they played because they beat them so bad. It was so, Stetson? No, Stetson was North Carolina. Was it? I think no, so. was it? No, yeah, it was UConn. You're right. They yeah, played, who, North Carolina had Wagner. Too many yeah, bad they were terrible. Green teams. Too many bad gray and green teams. Get, get some yeah. new colors. Um, but yeah, like at UConn won by freaking 91 to 52 and then 75 to 58. So they haven't even, you know, they have not been tested. Haven't broken a sweat in this tournament yet. So, but that's about as far as the advantages go for San Diego State. I just think UConn's a wagon. I I really wish that Auburn would have made it here because I think they would have had, you know, top to bottom the athletes to at least give UConn a run, at least give them a tough game. Yeah. I don't. I mean, Jaden Ledi is a great player for San Diego State, but I think Lamar Butler, he's got ice in his veins. I don't know, man. I, I obviously, I think matchup wise, I would rather play San Diego State. Although I like, I think if your team has a good power forward, that's probably the weakest link we have defensively because we're gonna trap, obviously. But I mean, if if you can get through a trap, we're in trouble. So, I I I want San Diego State to win. I don't know how realistic it is. I I think UConn. They look better than they did last year, and they won a national championship last year. So I don't know quite what that means. I, I think what it means is, like, the jig is up. I, I hope think. I hope so. Because it's like, yes, Auburn is a team that could have punked you. Like, that, that is a team that could realistically, in the Sweet 16, punk UConn. Like, I think they could kill them if given the opportunity. But San Diego State, I think, is really good at keeping these games close and like awkwardly close and they know how to kind of play in chaos. So if you're going to muck up a game, this is the game to muck up because if it gets close down to the wire, I don't know if UConn's ready for that. Right. And I would guess some of these guys still have the bad taste in their mouths from the national championship. I mean, they just got ran out that gym after a crazy game to FAU. UConn just said, now nah, we're, we're, we're going to take this. You're yeah. Gonna, and it's like, how do you respond? There. Like, right. it's more of a, it's a heart game at this point. Right. And Dan Hurley has kind of just been like the never satisfied guy, like Mr. No fun. Like yeah, dudes winning by 40. He's like, I'm just not satisfied. We didn't play our best basketball. Like, shut up, shut up, yeah. dude. <laughs> I'm going to break your glasses, but yeah. he's, it, we'll see. We'll see. I, I don't know. That's going to be a fun matchup. Um, I definitely think the top three matchups are going to be Duke Houston, Iowa state, Illinois, and uh, San Diego state, UConn. The other one I'm going to shout out, Alabama, North Carolina. That might be a, the first team to 110. Uh, North Carolina plays defense, yeah. but they can certainly fill it up. So if, if they're just like, screw it, let's see who doesn't score first. That game might just be fun from purely like an entertainment standpoint. And it's going to be at Staples Center. I'm not calling it Crypto.com Arena. Come on, man. Not Put some chain. respect on Crypto. Uh, so that, that'll be fun. There'll be, that'll be showtime in L.A. for sure. Um, the, I think it's going to be equivalent to uh, you remember the Luke May buzzer beater against uh, Kentucky yeah. and De'Aaron Fox. Yeah. I think it could be that high scoring, like one one hundred three to one hundred two final. Like right, 
and just like like the last minute is gonna probably be like what is going on yeah no one's gonna miss in the last two minutes um that's the thing that i was gonna like even though there wasn't a lot of upsets now we have some great sweet 16 matchups just kind of up and down and i think that's what the tournament was trying to do yeah like they they got what they wanted yeah so i don't know if going forward they're gonna continue to do this this formula but I don't know, man. I think any any tournament with with uh, NC State as the eleven seed, I think yeah. they are like yeah, I love them in the sweet. I you still, it's still chaotic enough to be like I don't know, man. I don't know if we should. She, I, you just gotta have balance. You gotta have balance. Don't put Auburn in this region ever again. You selfish yeah. bastards. Like the committee just like was like, yeah, one of one of these teams is gonna be sacrificed, and let's let's do one of the more deserving teams at that. You know, right? It's unbelievable. But uh, you you wanted to talk about Kentucky, Oakland, which yeah. for most of my life thought was in Oakland, California. I was greatly mistaken. Uh, the only reason I know it's not is because uh, Cyclone Legend, shout out Percy Gibson, um, transferred from Iowa State to Oakland probably ten years ago, and I was like, why would he go to California? He's from Michigan. Come to find out. Oakland's in Michigan because why not? So that's the only Very reason I knew it. I think a lot of people probably think it's in the Bay Area. So, well, and too, like I told you last weekend, man, I was like, man, some if you get a three seed, we are going to lose to a fourteen seed. Yeah. And what happened to Kentucky? They lost to the fourteen. It, bro, death taxes and. A 14 seed upset in a three seed every March. Like it, it's yeah. it's become such a like a it, it's it's like breathing air. It's it's, it's you're not going to get around it. You're going to have to do it. It's going to have to happen. You know, and man, Calipari, they were tearing him a new ass last week, man. Like, yeah. oh my god, it was actually there's this one guy on TikTok that's like like breaking down the tape as to like why like like. Calipari's not even teaching like these guys like how to get through like a stagger screen like right. It, it, it's it's bad, man. To to have all the like I get it. You're you're getting guys to the promised land. You're getting guys who end up being max players in the NBA. But man, to to not be able to produce at the tournament, it's almost like I I I was I heard this interesting point where they think Cal should be the face of Kentucky basketball, but they need to have this like sicko who's calling all the shots. X's right. and O's wise, who's actually teaching these kids how to like basically Cal doesn't need to be doing any actual X's and O's coaching. Like you just need to recruit guys to get there. Right. Um, what, what, what do you think, I guess, is going forward for Kentucky basketball? How do you, how do they get out of this, this lump? I mean, his buyout is nuts. And like you said, I, I think he's almost so good at recruiting. He doesn't even, he doesn't put near the amount of work in on, on the, the X's and O's side. Right. Cause I mean, you have, it's almost like the opposite of TJ Alsberger where you have all the talent in the world, but you, you, I mean, they, they just aren't coached up to their potential. I think Dillingham Shepard Reeves, like all of those guys are NBA guys. Yeah. Um, I saw somewhere that Shepard is like the number one overall pick on some sites, which I think that it's, he varies from like one to six, but yeah. they, most of them, most of them got him going to San Antonio, which is very fitting. So yeah, that would be, that'd be a good, a good fit for Wendy. Um, but yeah, like, I think you're exactly right. I, I don't think it's the case in Iowa State because I think odds one can't do that with the talent he has, but like he needs a Kyle Green, Calipari does. Like you just need some guy that does all the dirty work as a coach and just let Cal fly out to LA and get, you know, the number one recruit in the country. And then back in Lexington, just have some guy barking orders and teaching these guys how to actually play basketball instead of just a, a free meal ticket to the NBA. So but nothing's going to change. His buyout's like in the 30 million. So he's going to be back next year. But yeah, I mean, they're like, what, one in three in the past five years of the NCAA tournament? So, well, just since 2012, they haven't had the best track record. Like right. outside of 2015, this last final, I mean, they're a lot like Duke right now. Last final four they've been to. Well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Duke made it in 22. So uh, yeah, they still haven't made it since 15. Yeah. So for sure. And then the I think like in between 2012 where they won it in 2015, those last two final fours they were in, like 
those two years in between where they had Noel and Julius Randle, like un- underperformed right. both of those years, even when they made the Final Four in 2014. So I just think, man, it's like we they work so hard to get those guys there, and then they get there, and it's almost like Cal at times may be a little overstimulated with all the talent he has that right. he almost doesn't know how to use it because he doesn't recruit as like, I'm going to recruit talent-wise, but let me try to build a good team while I'm at it too. Cause at, he's just getting guys that are just ready to go after one year. So I don't know. It's kind of the culture you create too, of just like, I'm going to get you the NBA. All right. You're going to get guys who are just thinking about the NBA. They don't care about the 14 seed. They got to play on a Thursday afternoon, you know? So uh, it's, it looks like it's, it's troubled times in Lexington for sure. I, I think the hero to the demise of Kentucky is Jack Golke, who, Shout out Pewaukee, Wisconsin. Whatever's in the water up there. Yeah, what are they uh, doing up there? <laughs> I, you got I J.J. Watt, Jack Gokey, and Milan Mumcho. What are y'all feeding these kids? I wish I would have grown up in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, Nigel. I'd be, I, I'd be a 25-year-old grad transfer in D1 basketball right now if I grew up over there, I think. Because, like, yeah, that dude, the craziest stat of all time is him, A, dribbling it three times against Kentucky, Clay I think Johnson he had like six beat. or seven dribbles. Yeah. And then he's had like seven two-point shots all year and like hundreds of three-point shots. I mean, just like what a crappy recruiting, like what a ca- crappy scouting job on Kentucky. Like you you yeah. saw those tendencies and we're like, hmm. We'll live with we'll, it. We won't worry about it. We'll live with that. He's one of us. <laughs> Let him shoot. <laughs> like yeah. what? I mean, that guy, he's got – like a balding hairline. I mean, he just had every ingredient. He looks like my orthodontist. I'm not even joking. Yeah. And he was filling it up against Kentucky. Uh, I mean, that that was the best March performance. I, I don't know if you remember the name Fletcher McGee. Of course. But From Wofford, My right? buddy and I were so convinced that that guy was going to send Kentucky home sad. And he was going to go like 12 for 15 from three. He was going to be a household name. I think he made like one three the whole game. And yeah. this felt like the ghost of Fletcher McGee Redemption. being like, nah, we got that in him. And so shout out Jack Golke, who just – he was doing like NIL deals in the hotel like a, a day after you the game. You could tell they were like, last minute. <laughs> fully, you know, making his money while he can. So yeah. Well, he, it's he funny because in the press conference he's like, you know, I have nothing to lose. I don't want to go to the NBA. I know I'm not going to go to the NBA. And so many people were like, Pat Riley is somewhere watching this rubbing his hands because yeah. you know that man's going to get a summer league contract because you know that man was watching the game. You know Pat Riley went to Kentucky. You know that man yeah. is tuned in, and he probably, if if he can, get his hands on Reed Shepard. I think Pat Riley would, you know, he'd do a mob deal for Reed Shepard if he could. So There is a 10-day contract with Jack Golke's name on it somewhere in Miami right now. Absolutely. And, and they just haven't given it to him yet. I think he has Duncan Robinson potential if given the opportunity. You know, yep. to to make that type of impact, really on any team, but especially the Heat. I think just right. the Heat are they love guys like that, and they'll, they'll ride or die for guys like that. But um, yeah, no, just to see guys not be afraid of the moment that we've never heard of. I mean, March never fails when it comes to that. There's always going to yep. be a guy that you're not you you have no idea is a person until that Thursday afternoon, and then you know they light up the world. So I mean, it's such a cool opportunity to and again for P. Walkie to be producing yeah. this type of talent. I have so many friends from Wisconsin. When I talked about Milan signing to Iowa state, like in November um, last year, I was showing them like, uh, I was like, yeah, this kid's from Wisconsin. They're like, Oh, where that? And I was like, P walkie. And then they were like, Oh, P walkie. Like you can yeah. tell P walkie has like created that, that environment and narrative that like, they are the top dog in Wisconsin when it comes to athletics and man, like, it's, it's just it's extremely impressive to see what they've been able to, I guess, produce in the last decade. Because if you go from J.J. Watt to, to now, I mean, it, it went from kind of a football vibe. And even J.J. Watt hooped back in the day. He was a decent little, you know, pound him back to the basket power forward. So, I mean, it, it's just really cool to see what Pewaukee has been able to do and kind of put their name on the map being, you know, one of those out, outside of Milwaukee uh, small towns. Also, just looking kind of to wrap this thing up, Iowa State's path, got to take care of Illinois. And like, <clears throat> honestly, every game is losable. I think Illinois is the first one where I, I at least think the Sweet 16 was the expectation. 
the Elite Eight would be awesome. And then I think really anything on top of an Elite Eight is gravy. I, I don't expect to beat UConn if that's who we face. Um, I, I think we certainly have a chance. I think there's some holes in Illinois' game that, that benefit Iowa State. And then looking around across you know, the, the bracket below us, probably North Carolina or Arizona if we get that far. And then what I, you know, my, my dream would be playing Houston round four national championship. I mean, that would be, man, it'd just be a huge moment for the Big 12. For the brand of basketball, I like to watch to see like the two best defensive teams being a national championship and a final score. The over-under is going to be set at like 105. That's the kind of sicko basketball that I'll sign up for. Um, I hope it is Duke, but uh, Houston will be a nice second. Sure. A a long ways to go before we uh, play Houston and Phoenix, but – and do you feel better about the draw Iowa State got now as opposed to what we did a week ago? Or are you still kind of like, man, we got to play Illinois and UConn before we even get to the Final Four? More so of that. I don't want to yeah. give I don't want to give UConn the benefit of the doubt though, because I really do think South Dakota State could punk them. San Diego, San Diego. Uh, <laughs> too many SDS, SDSUs. SDSUs in this tournament. That's another yeah. problem. You got to yeah. pick one. Um, I think San Diego State could really punk uh, UConn if just keeping the game close. So I don't even want to give UConn that benefit of the doubt. I got to see y'all make it to yeah. believe it. But, yeah, no, I think I, I think we were always were one of the more elite teams in this region. It's just I hated the fact that, like, you couldn't benefit off the good year you had. You had to go through the gauntlet in order to make it to the promised land. So I think, you know, to answer your question, yes. But it's still not going to be easy. And the best mentality when it comes to making the final four and trying to pursue a national championship is to not be satisfied with the sweet 16. Like this shit is cute for NC state. And if they made it Oakland, like, but for us, man, like if Iowa state is going to start to become an elite basketball program, like we cannot look at this as like the Holy grail anymore. It was a Holy grail coming off the two and 22 season. But you kind of have to have this 09 Kobe Bryant mentality of like what what is there to be happy about? Right. It's only two games. What is there to be happy about? You got four more games left. The rest of these games need to be treated like an NBA playoff series, and you got to get the sweep. And it's going to only yeah. happen one game at a time. So, uh, it's, man, Boston is going to be an electric weekend in Boston. I don't know if the Celtics are playing. I would assume not. <laughs> but – uh, hopefully, hopefully Jason Tatum or some guys can can make a celebrity appearance. That'd be really cool too to just be like you're in one of the biggest games of your life, and oh my god, there's Jason Tatum watching me play. There's Jalen Brown. There's you know, Porzingis made an appearance. I, I think that's just gonna be a really cool atmosphere to be in. Also, if Larry Bird is free, maybe he can see his second coming, Milan Momchilovic, just a, a cold ass white boy filling it up in Boston. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what that city lives on nigel so yeah they're gonna um boston's gonna be like oh that's that mom chili beach yeah he's he's freaking it he's yeah. the freaking balls they're they're but, gonna yeah, no. we actually might not want him to go off because the celtics will draft mom chili beach in the first round if he drops 40 in the garden so maybe hide him actually a little bit i don't I want boston to get any idea who's yeah, that who, who, who's that write that down write that down write that down but yeah, no, I All think right, man, you got anything? You uh, got anything before man. we get out of here? Yeah, shout out to Jared McCain, man. Two days into college. Three like shares behind. 30 points. They just just some he must like the number 30 because he's done this multiple times now. And like to do it off of eight threes, like he's bro, he's gone after this year. He's gone after this year. So and even if you're not a Duke fan, man. That is the most likable Duke character in most recent years. Like outside of Zion, if if the nail painting is the thing that grinds your gears, like I there's been worse, you know. <laughs> like there I, I, I can understand hating flip, but man, yeah, you're gonna like anyone on that Duke team. It's definitely it's definitely gotta be Jared McCann. I like Jared McCain in the sense that he's gonna get locked up by Jamal Shedd for 40 minutes. That's what I like. About Man, get, get Houston in foul trouble. They they showed y'all their kryptonite yeah. last night. They're not, they're not get deep. Get them in foul trouble. Yeah. So I think if Duke can execute that man, like it is what it is. So we'll see. It's going to be a great game. 
All right, a lot of March to go. Nigel, I, you know, we're, we're coming towards the end of the season. Happy that we have, you know, basketball to look forward to because we, we could have, this could have been the, the season end podcast. So, yeah, good on the Cyclones. A, a lot more to do coming up. Um, Illinois, Thursday, get your nitroglycerin pills. Going to be a late one um, on Thursday night. Yeah, I, I hope this isn't a, the, the last podcast that, you know, I just hope to say I hope to say it, man. <laughs> yeah, I really do. But uh, I I believe in this team, and I think we'll get it. We'll get it done this week. So we'll see. Keep letting them cook. All right, that's all. That's all we got from Fanatic. Uh, looking forward to some more great basketball in March.